Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Lavinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to welcome Tana French live from Dublin for the release of her new novel, The Searcher, in conversation with Dennis Lehane. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become the bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to Tana and Dennis for joining us this afternoon. So to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We'll try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. Uh, a caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please do bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And we'll be continuing our virtual event series uh, across the fall and into the spring. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I do want to point out uh, happening next Tuesday, we're bringing Jeff Tweedy to the virtual stage for the release of his new book, How to Write One Song, in conversation with Nora Jones. And tickets for that event are on sale now. And finally, The Searcher came out just today, so congrats, Tana. And your copies have begun shipping. Uh, of course, with the pandemic, postal delays have become quite common, so please do give up to three to four weeks for those packages to arrive. So now a little about our, our authors, and we'll get started. Tana French is the author of seven previous books, including In the Woods, The Likeness, and The Witch Elm. Her novels have sold over 3 million copies and won numerous awards, including the Edgar Anthony McCavity and Barry Awards, the Los Angeles Time Award for Best Mystery Thriller, and the Irish Book Award for Crime Fiction. She lives in Dublin with her family. And Dennis Lehane is the award-winning best-selling author of 13 novels, including Live by Night, uh, Mystic River, Gone Baby Gone, Shutter Island, and most recently, Since We Fell. He lives in California with his family. So Tana and Dennis, the stage is yours. Thank you. How are you? Hi, how's it going? It's good to see you. Nice to be here and thank you so much for doing this. Happy to do it. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with a strictly writerly question. Um, your, uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this is because uh, I find your writing on a sentence to sentence, paragraph to paragraph level, uh, quite extraordinary. And it shows for me an attention to, to craft and the pure pleasure of perfectly chosen words um, that I find rare and extremely hard to pull off these days. Um, not just in our chosen uh, genre, but in literature in general. So my first question is, um, how seriously do you take your craft? Oh yeah, very seriously. Yes, and thank you by the way for that, very seriously. I think the stuff that words can do is what first made me fall in love with the idea of writing. I can still remember, I can still remember I was six and my dad was reading me The Wind in the Willows at bedtime. And he got to the sentence, um, I'm probably gonna get this a bit wrong, but it was, he had never seen a river before, that sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal. And I just went, whoa, look, look what words can do. Look what you can do with words. You can make this magic happen. And ever since then, I've been completely hooked on that power that the perfectly chosen word can have, how you can evoke something, an image that, that isn't, it isn't in front of people. And yet you feel like you're not just seeing what the author sees, but feeling what the author felt about it. So I've been hooked on that power of the perfectly chosen word ever since. And I take that really seriously. I go back over every sentence, every single sentence, seven, eight times, because you have to not just get it right but you have to make it feel effortless if it wants, if you want right. to get it out, right? And that's the, you know, that's the 10th, 11th, 12th draft, maybe by that time, it should be starting to feel effortless. That's great. That's great. Um, so based on that, so I, I would assume then, because I, I do, I'm always shocked by people who want to be writers who don't read, that always stuns me. Um, I, I, I liken it to you want to be a doctor and because you watched a lot of ER. Um, so my, my question then would be, who, who are your influence? Who moved you um, uh, most as a reader? You already said Wind and Willows, but uh, who do you aspire to emulate when you write? One of the ones that, I, okay, I've read this maybe a dozen times, I don't know, and it hits me every single time is Watership Down. Richard Adams. And that's another one I read really young. I would have been seven and I got, you know, what do you get at seven? Maybe a quarter of it I got, but it didn't matter because even if you don't get it, you can tell it's greatness. You can tell that the sentences are incredible. You can tell that something incredibly powerful is happening, 
even if you don't get any of the, you know, the political undercurrents, the social undercurrents, none of that, you know, maybe some of the geography you don't get, you still know that something amazing is happening here. You still know that, that this thematically, it's hugely powerful and that the characters and the character arcs are powerful things. And that combination of stunning writing and wonderful characterization and gripping plot, still now I would love to be able to do something at that level. There are still moments of that book after a dozen writings, or after a dozen readings, there are still moments that make me tear up or that make the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And right. that's what I'd like to do is have something so perfectly captured that after a dozen readings, people are still going, now that, that right there is perfection. That's great. I think, you know, it's funny. I think that there's a, um, I, I, one of the things I feel about this profession is if you're any good at it, if you're truly good at it, you truly take it seriously, um, you'll never be happy. <laughs> yeah. You won't, you won't. Like the people who yeah. are like, oh, I find writing easy. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, if, if I did it that badly, I'm sure I'd find it easy too, you know? <laughs> like it's really, it, it beats having a real job for a living. Don't get me wrong. I think yeah. it's the best job in the world, but if you do it well, it's exceptionally hard and you never feel you're good enough because okay. you're always, you're looking at Richard Adams. You're looking, you know, I'm looking at yeah, Fitzgerald. You know what I mean? It's like Raymond Carver. You know, you can't ever feel like you're worthy. Yeah, but that's a great thing though, because you don't ever want to feel like, yeah, I'm good enough. I'm good. I'm fine. I don't, I don't like that mentality that Asher, it's grand. It'll do. I think it, to be honest, I think it's one of the curses of Ireland. The Asher, it'll do. It's grand mentality rather than going, no, 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 this has to be amazing. And once, if I can make it amazing, then I'm going to want it to be better and better and better. I think that's the only way you get places. And I still am. I'm still nitpicking the searchers out today and I'm still going, don't, that sentence mm. there is not right. And that, you know what, that, bit of characterization there I should have changed that and that's why I don't go back and read them for years after they're published because I'm going to find things where I'm going damn it that should be different I want to go back and change that I need my red pen I need my delete button and I think that's that's the only way you get better is by getting good enough to recognize what you're doing wrong so that next time you know you're still going to screw it up in certain ways but at least they won't be the same ways over and over again right right yeah I remember I remember somebody waxing rhapsodic to me about Gone Baby Gone years after I wrote it, years. And and I was like, uh, okay, all right. And then I went home and I said, well, I should probably see what everybody's talking about. And I picked <laughs> it off the shelf and I read the first couple of pages and I was appalled at how bad it was. And I was <laughs> like, and I closed it and I never looked at it again. Like I was <laughs> like, I can't go back and look at my work. It's just and particularly after you do a book tour, because after you do a book tour, what do you do when you're on a book tour? You, you read, read the book, you read yeah. The book, you Talk know, about your book, read your book, yes. and then yeah, and you you are constantly going, oh damn it, maybe yeah, I should have done that differently. My agent once told me, he said, oh you haven't read the book, you will never read. Maybe in ten years you'll read the book, but you will never read the book because you're so close to it when you're actually writing it, and mm -hmm. it's only when you get a little bit of distance from it that you start being able to see it with any kind of detachment. And that's when you start getting really hard on it. That's when you start yeah. going, my God, what was I thinking? Yeah. That yeah. needs to be different. So that's a that's a lesson to all of you, um, you know, uh, aspiring writers out there, you know, if you want to be good at this, um, you'll you'll hate it. You'll hate your own work. That's, there we go. That's what we're giving you. That's what, <laughs> French, that's what the Irish people are giving you. No matter what's going to yeah. happen, it'll drive you to drink. <laughs> it's um, <gonna> be <laughs> but it's uh, wonderful to find a sentence that you did right. When for some reason, like you're going back over an old book for some reason, to, you know, what was that character called again? I need to make sure I don't reuse that surname. And you're skimming through an old book and you go, huh, actually, I still really like that line of dialogue yes. seven years later or whatever it is. It's a wonderful feeling. That is, that's one, that, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you that. No, I recently had to <laughs> do a, tw a 20 year, and I feel so old now, I had to do a 20 year anniversary uh, recollection of Mystic River. And I, and I reached out to a, a line in the book that I loved when I wrote it. I loved when I edited it. I loved 20 years later. I was like, oh, it still works. Okay, phew, phew. Which one is it? Um, it's, it's uh, the character is thinking about his father and he's thinking about whether he, he knew him or whether he invented uh, all of these exchanges that happened between them over, yeah. over time, so. 
Um, yeah. I can't really quote it, but. Um, That's one of my, but my inspiration books, actually, you were saying who's been inspiration. Mystic River was one of those books. I read it. I read the Kenzie and Gennaro ones, love them. But I read Mystic River just a couple of years before I started writing. And it kind of blew the idea of the genre wide open for me because there's always been this sort of perception, which was never true, but it was always the right. perception that over here you've got genre, right? And it's got kind of workmanlike writing and, you know, 2D characters. The plot's pretty gripping, but there's no themes or anything like that. It's just, you know, an, an easy read. It's popcorn. And over here, you've got literature where it's got deep characterization, deep themes. Maybe not much happens, but the writing is beautiful. And I read Mystic River and it was like, you know, I'm not going to say, because I'm not sure I'm allowed to swear on this Zoom, but it was like, no, forget that. Right. right. It's like, right. no, I can the characterization, this can be an in-depth, a coming of age story and a social history of a neighborhood and have deep family saga going on in there. And it can have a gripping plot, thanks very much, and a mystery and beautiful writing. There was no sense of, you have to pick some and leave the others behind. It was like, no, 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 I'm gonna go for it all. And that to me blew the idea, all that idea of the genre boundaries wide open. And it was an amazing thing to read at that particular stage. It was just wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. I think that, you know, I think there was a lot of us who were coming up around the early 90s to mid 90s who were coming from that perspective. We were just like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, why should we accept that? You know, we were like stuck between, I don't want to read about the vaguely dissatisfied in Connecticut, which is what <laughs> yep. American lit was at that point, American literary fiction was at that point. And I don't really want to read the cheap paperbacks that don't have respect for prose, don't have respect for craft. I don't, you know, they offend me too. So I think there was a lot of people coming up right around that time who said, you know, in America, and then you just saw various movements, you know, you saw these mini movements happen in the 2000s and in, in the, you know, Danish countries, you know, and, um, but I think there was just a lot of us going, why should we accept that it is one thing? Why should mm. we accept that it has to be this, you know, the, the ham-fisted man with the hat and the, you know, the dames and the, you know, the, just the terrible misogynistic stuff that was going on. So um, yeah, good. I'm glad. I'm glad it's been, uh, I think that's, that's what I, when I read your work, I feel like I am reading from the first sentence on, I feel like I am reading literature and I, I believe literature is literature. I don't believe literary fiction is naturally literature and I don't believe genre fiction is naturally not. Yeah. You know? So, um, so to, let's talk a little bit about the searcher then. Um, to the best of my recollection, is this the first you've written in third person? Yeah, bits of the secret place were in third person, but this is the first one that's been entirely in third person, and it was kind of dictated by the narrator actually, because for me that's what sets the tone of the book. Is the well protagonist in this case, not narrator, but you know what I mean. Yeah. He's this is the person who who defines the world of the book. And in this case, I was writing a guy who, unlike many of my previous narrators, was not about what was happening inside his head. He doesn't consider that to be a priority. Cal doesn't think it's very important what you think or what you say. He thinks that what's important, the way you know a person, is through what they do, through their actions. Yeah. So for him, the point of the perspective of the book wouldn't be, well, you need to see what's going on inside his head because he wouldn't actually give a damn about anyone knowing what goes on inside his head. He would, for him, the important thing is that you know what he does. So this was always going to be a book based on Kyle's character that was about what he does, which made the third person seem to make more sense because it focuses less on what he thinks and what he feels. I mean, there's room for that, but that's not the top priority. The top priority is he goes over the, there, he does this, he talks to this person. So that's why it went third person from the start. And how did that feel? after so much first because there's, there's so many benefits to first but then there's that restriction to first you know yeah. you can't step out yeah whereas, yeah whereas with third you've got a lot more room to step out and move around and to to go into their head as much or as little as you please if you just want to keep the action moving you can just show what they're doing if that's what's the focus of the thing you've got a lot more scope to leave out feelings as well um yeah, it was also, it was a nice break, I have to say, after The Witch Elm, which was very much about the inside of somebody's head. That was the center of the action, was inside the narrator's head. That was the most important place. That was where most of the narrative arc took place. So it was a nice break to have that detachment and to see how does that work differently and what new 
yeah, like you say, what new freedoms does it give you? And also what limitations does it give you and how do you work within those? Because it was new, yeah, new territory for me and I liked it. Okay, that's great. Um, so uh, what, um, what was it now with, with Cal being an American? I know that I just wrote, uh, my last book was the first book entirely from a female point of view. And that was weird. It was wonderful, but it was weird. So this is um, not quite the same thing, but it's you are writing your first main American character. How did that feel? What did you bring to the table that was a little different? <laughs> well, that kind of happened almost by accident. Like this is gonna be a slightly long rambling answer, but I will get there in the end. <laughs> I had been reading a lot of Westerns and I was thinking about how the settings of the Westerns seem to have a lot of resonances I guess with the west of Ireland where like it's this harsh country and it demands physical and mental toughness from anyone who wants to make a living out of it and it also it's not just geographically but also culturally very distant from the centers of power so that people living there feel like the power brokers have absolutely no idea about their lives and don't actually care and it's up to them to set any rules and enforce any rules that they need to keep society functioning. I thought, how would some of that, those Western tropes work if you transpose them to the West of Ireland? Like what would work and what wouldn't? And one of the ones I really liked was the stranger in town. You know mm -hmm. how he rolls into the Western, he comes into the saloon yeah. and maybe he's not, he's got secrets and you know things are gonna change around him. You know, he's gonna disrupt things. Like, you, I don't know, he's gonna shoot the villain and everything's gonna to return to order or he's gonna shoot the hero and everything will be devastated or he's gonna get shot because he sticks his nose in where it doesn't belong, but he's gonna be a catalyst. Right. So I want a stranger in town, but you know Ireland, right? Mm -hmm. If he was Irish, there is no way he would be a stranger in town. Somebody would know him. Like exactly. even if he'd never been to that town before, you know, maybe he went out with a girl from there or his mother would have worked with a woman from there. His dad would play poker. It's an island. There is a connection. And right. within her, the, the local like shopkeeper and information broker, she would have found that connection and she would be all over it. Yeah. So he had to be from somewhere else. He had to be from an entirely different country. So I made him American. And it, I mean, I was a bit nervous doing it because Culturally, I'm not American. Like I lived there, but the last time I lived there, I was seven. So I felt like linguistically, I would need to be very careful to get this right. And I had not only my editor, but an American friend bet it for me to make sure that I didn't slide into Irishisms here and there, which, which I did, you know, even up to the proofread, I was catching things like windscreen for windshield, you know, stuff like right. that. But also mentality wise, I think being, a cop in America is going to be a very different thing from being a cop in Ireland. So I did an awful lot of reading on, on the internet, on message boards for like law enforcement in the US and stuff, just to see what, what is it like? What is this experience like? And what am I going to have to get right? It's a little bit, it feels a little bit cheeky writing from a perspective that is quite so far from yours. And it feels like a responsibility as well. You're like, I better get this right. I better not throw any in any Irishisms here. I'd better make this ring true because people will catch me on it and they'll be annoyed and they'll have every right to be. So I hope enough people vetted it that I got it right. I didn't feel, yeah, I, I never felt uh, uh, while, while I was reading it that I was not, not only not that I was not reading a male, I felt like I was confidently in the, the perspective of male psyche, but I also felt like this is an American. This is a, a you know, um, so, so yes, um, good, well done. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, there was a book once that was written by a Brit, but it was set in America. And, and I read the whole book and the one distracting thing w that gave it away the whole time was that every time the character reached for his cell phone, he called it a mobile. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and we never yes. use mobile, you know, yeah. it was always cells, you know, so um, uh, that's good. Okay. So the, the idea of um, the Western, which I, I felt as I was reading it as well, that just came from this idea of doing the West of Ireland, the rural of, of Ireland. Um, I know that uh, um, there's late in the novel, a character, uh, says they fear that uh, they fear the small the small town turning into a wasteland and uh, losing its young men to uh, untraditional or harmful notions. That's yeah. that's I, that's I'm 
paraphrasing because I can't say what type of notions because it wouldn't <laughs> reveal. Yeah. That's essentially it. Um, and that seems to me to pit rural, which is traditional values versus urban, which is modern values. Um, is that a common conflict in Ireland still? Yeah, no, there's very much still the perception that the city people are, they don't understand what rural people, what, what their lives are like, what they have to go through, and that city people are doing stuff that is not only far removed from Irish tradition, like culturally, religiously, and in all kinds of ways, but also that they're doing stuff that is in many ways less useful which I can understand because if you're out there milking cows and producing something concrete every day, yeah. I can see how it would, it would be easy to go, some guy making IT tech support phone calls to a call center, that's not the same thing in, in concrete terms. That's not the same, doesn't have the same weight of keeping society functioning, keeping life going as producing you know, milk, meat, wheat, the concrete right. thing keep life going but there's also kind of a cultural divide where traditionally Ireland was very a very Catholic country and in urban areas that's not so much a thing anymore maybe for the older generation a bit more but a lot of my generation even the ones who still you know go to church at Christmas or have their kids baptized they're not the same they're not the same level of religiousness whereas in the rural areas it's much more a thing because among other things, the church is one of the, the social hubs. It's one mm -hmm. of the community mm -hmm. hubs. So it's much more woven into the fabric. And so there's still that sense that between rural and urban, that the urban people have left behind Irish tradition to a large extent. And there's always gonna be the urban rural thing where the rural people figure those city kids think they're so smart. They look down on us, who do they think they are? So there, there still is a definite tension there where there's a sense that the, the the needs are in conflict mm -hmm. and that most politicians, but not all, would prioritize the needs of city people and businesses over the needs of rural people. It's not necessarily true, but there's a perception there, sure. I think. And that adds to that Wild West feel, I think, that we're on our own here. We've got to fight our own corner because nobody else is going to do it for us. Right, right. And you see that, you do see that in the rural sections of the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that you do see, you see it reflected often in taxes. And one of the ways I, I, I do empathize with the people in the rural areas is to say, when you drive out there and you don't see hospitals and you don't see well-paved roads and you don't, you say, well, why, if I wasn't seeing what my tax dollars were doing, why would I want to pay taxes? You know, as opposed like, whereas, you know, in the city, you can usually point to it. It's right across the street. You can, you know, you can say that or you can say that word. My, I can see how my taxes are working. Um, so yeah, I do find that rugged individualism of the rural, rural areas, something I thought was very evocative in the book and also very elegiac. I thought that there was a sense of sadness of it yeah. being swept away. Yeah, I think there is. I think for a lot of people, it's being eroded and they feel it very strongly that even though in some ways, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because there were downsides to the traditional rural life. There were, there were ways in which people could feel very trapped and very repressed and very confined. But there's also a beauty to knowing where you stand and knowing where you fit within a community yeah. and knowing that because the community is a small one, everything you do has value to that community and everything you do influences it. It gives it's a sense of your own place in the world and of you having a rightful place and doing something that makes a difference. And I think that being eroded is leaving people feeling kind of sad and adrift and well, where are we supposed to belong now if there's no longer this sense of a community, if people are leaving, if people are going up to the city and if the the things like the pub sing-alongs and the church get-togethers, if those are going, what's going with them? What sense of community support and togetherness is being eroded there? And there's a lot, I think, to miss there. Yeah, yeah. Again, I think, you, you know, you what you were saying is, yes, some things that are binding people or some things that were uh, too restrictive on people are being swept away and that's good. But then all these beautiful things can be swept away. And, yeah. and further, you know, when I was there, 
last time I was there, which was two years ago, um, and I went to the family farm, which has been in our family for over 200 years. And the uh, my cousin who runs it was saying, I got nobody to give it to. I mean, my kids in my kids in IT, my other kids in this, my you know, they they don't want to be farmers. And we we're like, wait a minute, this is 200 years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then they were all talking at the time about how they were um, enforcing, this is a way out in the country, and they were suddenly enforcing very strict driving under the influence laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the pub culture, because yeah. in, the, in the farm communities, you go to the pub at the end of the night, you have several pints, you drive back home. Often you wrap your car around a tree, but it, it, they, were, <laughs> they were like, they're taking it away from us. We can't walk to the pub, it's too far away. Yeah, and, and there's no taxi, there's no bus, there's no taxi, you don't have any option, yeah? There's no Uber. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no in the middle of- yeah, I think, so- I, oh, yeah, there's always been a weird tension, I think, in Ireland uh, between past and present. And I put it down to, to British colonization because if you've been colonized for 700 years or whatever, well, then you come out of it, then your relationship with your past has been pretty skewed. And you're not, it's going to be hard to determine how much of that past do we want to hold on to and how much do we just want to forget because it. In fairness, it wasn't great. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, there's a tendency to mythologize. So once you start trying to balance those things, it's a very jagged, very fraught relationship. Do you just, and it tends, there tends to be a perception that you've got to have one or the other, that if you value the past, you're devaluing the present. And if you value the present, you have to ditch the past. There's not a lot of room for nuance. So you'll have arguments like, you know, do we, bulldoze this millennia old ring fort in order to build a pharma plant and it turns into an argument between heritage versus our future and it's quite hard for people to move those parameters and go actually can't we balance them can't they work together can't we keep hold of the past and still build towards the future because there's always been this very painful tension between the two so it turns into something that that is more of a dichotomy than it needs to be and it's much harder to balance than it needs to be so I think that's going on down in the rural areas as well where people are going you know how do we let go of things how do we not how do yeah it's it's a hard place for Irish people I think well and you also have in this novel you have <laughs> the modern world um in some of the uglier aspects of the modern world ultimately infringing I don't know if you can speak about that without too many spoilers Yes. But I, I felt like, you know, this is about something that's coming into the country from the city that's mm-hmm. very scary. Yeah, that's very scary and very destructive, not just on a more abstract level where it destroys the network of relationships within the community, but where it destroys individuals as well. You know, people are being eroded and broken down. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of what's sent down to the country from the city does turn out that way, does turn out to be a destructive force. Not all of it. Obviously, you know, there, there's stuff like the government sending down people to build better roads or to put in broadband, but that tends to go slowly, take a while, whereas the stuff that flies under the radar and is destructive comes in very quickly and it does a hit and run. It's going back to the Westerns thing, it's bandits coming in yeah. and doing, raiding and running. And that's what you see in this book when you when, when we know that, um, I mean, I don't know how specific you want to get on it, but we do know that that Bob has come into a rural area that seems, I mean, Cal has come into a rural area that seems seems out of time and yet time is is encroaching and, and there are certainly intimations of a drug culture on its way. Yeah, a drug, drug culture that has come down from the city and is infiltrating in there. And to him, I think that's a shock because he, was aiming for somewhere that was small and that was simple. That's what he's looking for is somewhere there where there are, where right and wrong are quite simple things. They're not as intricate and tangled as they were for him in the city. And he was thinking, even though he's from a place uh, where he, he knows perfectly well that small towns have all kinds of drugs because there's nothing else for kids to do. So they've got a lot of other stuff going on. He was hoping that somewhere this far away from home, somewhere like Ireland, in the back of beyond of Ireland, things would be simple and he'd be able to get away from all of that. And for him, it's a big shock when he finds this world that he was hoping to leave behind 
encroaching on this picturesque idyllic spot. This is not what he was hoping for. And there's almost a sense of invasion of the Garden of Eden for him, where he mm. was hoping this was Arcadia he'd found and it turns out not to be. So that for him is, even though he's new there, it's an upsetting thing that this idea he had of this one peaceful place, this one simple place, isn't going to turn out to be that way. Because is it, because I think we all yearn for this, but in reality, you know, is, is such a thing or was such a thing ever possible? Or is it, or is it always, we always dream of the innocent's place, but the innocent place was never the innocent place, you know? Um, I, I do wonder about that. I think of, I always think of um, Shadow of a Doubt, which is a Hitchcock movie uh, that Thornton Wilder wrote. And oh. it, it was written in 1941. And it's very much about San Jose, California being this wonderful, picturesque, small town America in which everybody was happy. And the entire film is a satirization of that and saying by the end, there is no simple place. There's evil is everywhere. Sadness is everywhere. Lack of, you know, corruption is everywhere. End of innocence is everywhere. Um, but yet there is this beautiful relationship at the center of the book, I thought, between Cal and, and Trey Reddy. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. 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 And um, could you could you speak about that a little bit? Cal runs into this this, this kid. Uh, yes, this this yeah, child. This kid shows up, um, and basically, he, at the beginning of the book, he's got a feeling that someone's watching him in his little fixer upper cottage that he's bought himself in the west of Ireland, and he's not particularly happy about that because again, he thought this was going to be somewhere really peaceful, and the idea of someone watching him makes his all his. And cop senses tingle, but it turns out to be a 13 year old kid who a very kind of wary, scrappy, not particularly well cared for 13 year old kid who wants someone to investigate the disappearance of his older brother who went missing six months ago and no one seems to care, not the village, not the police, no one seems to care that his big brother Brendan has gone missing. And Trey demands very persistently that Cal should find out what happened to Brendan. And both of them are, are, are looking for something relatively concrete out of this relationship. I mean, for Cal at the beginning, what he's looking for is to find some answers so his kid will buzz off and leave him alone. Whereas right. Ray is looking for some answer on his brother, but they are also looking for something else, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. And that Trey, his dad has gone off somewhere, possibly London, who knows. And he's looking for someone to show him how to grow up into somebody who he wants to be. And Cal, who has a grown up daughter who their relationship's kind of fractured and distant and his career didn't end on a good note. He's looking for a way to feel again like he's someone who knows right from wrong and does the right thing. And they end up sort of finding that in each other, even though it's not exactly what either of them thought they went in looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, Cal does say uh, he differentiates between uh, manners versus morals. Yeah. Uh, and and, um, and um, so how do, how do you see that distinction? Well, I, I kind of see it as a little more complicated than Cal does, because for him, again, words don't mean very much. So most things to do with words are just plain. That's an issue of manners. That's not morals. What you call somebody, <clears throat> it's polite to call somebody what they would like to be called, but that's not a moral issue. For him, morals come down to actions and what you do is either right or wrong. And for him, at the beginning of the book, he would like that distinction to be very clear. And by the end, he's kind of coming to terms with the fact that none of those distinctions between manners and morals and between right and wrong are as clear as he would like them to be. But yeah, early on in the book, he's got a very clear sense that as long as you try to do right by everybody you come across and you try to get stuff done, those are a matter of morals. Morals are the things that you would do no matter in what circumstance. I think the example he uses to Trey is if there's, there's a guy trapped in a burning car then no matter what kind of bastard that guy is, you pull him out. If he's been a complete jerk to you, you might curse him, you might call him all kinds of names because that's a manners issue, but you'd still pull him out of that burning car. Your moral code is the things that you do 
no matter what. And manners are a little bit more flexible in situation. Okay. Um, right, so um, before, <laughs> before you were a writer, um, you were an actor, is that right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I think that's fascinating because I think both professions have these marked similarities, but I also think they have these marked differences. Um, yes. And uh, so how does Tana the actor influence Tana the writer? Okay, I think this was great training. I think being an actor was great training for being a writer because it is basically the same skill when you come down to it. Your job is you've got to create this character, you need to make them three dimensional and you need to pull in your audience so that they feel like they're seeing the whole world of this story through the character's eyes, through the character's, you know, the skewed view that anyone has on the world, through the character's biases and their fears and their needs. And hopefully they come away from the play or the book or whatever you've got, feeling like they know this person as intimately as they know their best friend. And it is also really good for writing dialogue because if I write a line and then I read it back and go, I could not get up on a stage and say that, then the line probably needs to change. So it's, it's really good training, I think. But on the other hand, it's a big shift because when you're acting, if you have one of those days where just nothing's happening, you're, you're not coming up with anything good. Then you've got your scene partner will throw something your way or the director will throw something your way. Someone will throw something that makes you, oh yes, okay, I know where I'm going now. Whereas when you're writing, it's you. And if you're having one of those days when you suck, it's up to you to pull yourself out of it. There's nobody else can do it for you. So it's a lot more solitary. Yes, far more, far more, far more, I would say. Uh, what's that? Oh, sorry, creatively as well as practically. You've got to get yourself out of your own messy dark parts, yeah. Yeah, that's the, I mean, the thing that I always feel is that the, the middle, uh, the, one of the loneliest experiences in the world is to be a writer in the middle of a book when it's all going <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. point where you're like, what was I doing again? Why did I think this was a good idea? Yeah. yeah. And it's there's always one moment in the course of every novel where you feel like it was a titanically bad idea. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yep. And no, I come out of out. sorry. Nobody gets you out. That's just you. No. no. I come out of my office swearing and tell my husband that I'm going to phone my agent and tell him I'm going to have to go back. I want to go be, be a broke actor again because this isn't working. And he goes, you know, have some more coffee. This happens every time. You know that. And I'm like, yes, but this time it's really not this working. This time it's real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, many of your novels feature uh, a house at the center of the narrative. Um, yeah. uh, the searchers, uh, the house is almost its own character, I would argue. Um, so what do you think what do you think keeps drawing you back to the concept why did, why did you feel it was such a um i mean this could have been organic i'm not saying you were conscious but why do you looking back at the book now why do you feel that the house became that such a symbolic i'm not saying what's symbolic of but certainly such a symbolic object in the middle of the no Sorry, no yeah i i love houses i mean i think that's obvious from reading my books. I put it down, I blend this on my childhood because we moved around so much. So the idea of a home where you can stay put was a really big thing in my mind, a home that you own. I mean, we never owned a house when I was a kid. I'm, I think the first person in my whole family to have bought a house. And it was a really big thing, this idea of a house where you can stay put and you can make it your own was a big deal to me. And I think it, it comes through in the books. And for Cal, that idea of a home, yeah, it was always going to be somewhere very charged because he's trying to, to rebuild his sense of where he belongs from scratch and to rebuild it into something that he's comfortable with mm -hmm. because he has found himself over the year or two before this book starts being very not at home in himself, very feeling like he's lost his way within himself and is no longer comfortable in this space. Why so is for that? Him, rebuilding. Well, he's had um, a divorce where he still is not completely sure what went wrong because he thought he was being a decent husband, being a good father, and has been forced to re-examine what that means and where he could have gone wrong. And he's still not completely sure how it all went to pieces. And in his job, there was, was an incident where his partner almost shot someone 
and Cal realized that he no longer felt that he had a, that he could trust either himself or his job to distinguish right from wrong clearly. So his marriage and his job were the places where he felt most like he was doing what he wanted to do, which is be a steady guy who fixes things and makes things better. And then all of a sudden he was forced to confront the fact that actually it may not be working that way. I may not in fact be doing things right or making things better either in my family or in my job. And so that's why he runs far away from both of them and ends up halfway across the world in a ramshackle cottage in Ireland. And to him, I think it does wind up symbolizing, okay, I wanna fix things, I'm gonna fix this. I wanna feel at home within my world. I'm gonna make myself at home within this. And of course it doesn't go that simply because otherwise there wouldn't be a book and it wouldn't be interesting, but that's right. what it means. Good. Um, so this is a question I'm always fascinated by and I find that readers are often fascinated by and I always have a terrible answer. I don't wanna see if yours is any better which is um, we've just talked about a lot of things that have gone into this novel, uh, plot, symbols, people, um, social issues. How much do you know before you write? Oh, not much, not much. I'm in awe of those writers who have, you know, they have it all outlined chapter by chapter, everything on a different page. And it's just, they know there's a book there. They know that when they dive in there, there's a book at the other end, all those plot lines are going to add up to something. I have the main character, I have a core location, so the house in yeah. a little, and I have a very basic premise. Like in this case, I knew he'd taken early retirement, he was in the west of Ireland, and some kid showed up going, you've got to find my brother. But that was basically it. I had no idea whether the brother was dead or alive, what had happened to him, where this relationship was going to go with the kid, whether they were ever going to find the brother, who had been involved in the brother vanishing, none of that. I have to figure it out as I go along. And I kind of put this down to the actor thing again, because I'm coming at it from the point of view of playing a character of the characters. And I can't figure out which character would do what and for what reasons until I've got to know them a bit. And I can only do that by writing them. So I have to dive in and write them and then figure out who did what and why. And it makes for a lot of rewriting because you get to chapter eight and you go, oh my God, he would so do this for this reason. Oh, then yeah, I'm gonna have to rewrite the whole of chapters uh -huh. two and three, right. which is annoying, but yeah. Do you do the same? Do you do it by uh, flying by the seat of your pants? Or do you like completely blind. It's so yeah. bizarre, and it, but it explains my output. You know what I mean? Like most of the people I started with have doubled my output. Like most of my yeah. peers have published like 26 books. I've published 13. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I get lost in them. And then I'm like, oh, no. And then I got to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild and rebuild. But um, which is strange because I do a lot of writing in TV and film. And I can't write a line without outlining that. Because that's how I was trained. But when I write a book, I can't. If I try to outline, it's terrible. Mm. I may have a plot. And I'm like, I got a plot. And then I go in and I'm 40 <laughs> pages in and I go to the exact same thing again, which is this plot sucks. You know, like, and then you got to just go follow where it takes you organically. Yeah. I figure that's got its pluses because I end up getting surprised along the way by stuff. I end up going, oh my God, that character that I put in in chapter one, just because I thought they'd be fun. They're going to be really important. And right. I have to hope that because it's taking me aback, because I've kind of subconsciously thrown something in that would come in useful. Hopefully it gives the audience the same sense of, oh, oh my God, didn't see that coming, that it gives me. I, I've got to hope that it has that sense of revelation for the audience and that it, it has that value and not just being me winging it and hoping there's a book in there somewhere. No, because I think I think you write as you, you, you write the book you want to read. Mm -hmm. And so in yeah. some ways, as a writer, you're a reader. And if you're entertaining yourself in that way and you're scrupulous with you know and it, with 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 your honesty with yourself i think you do produce yeah. good books that way they're just really painful to write you know yeah. that's, that's a lot of, a lot um, of i think it I, also does make it easier what you said about being honest with yourself the fact that you're going okay i am winging it here makes it easier to be honest because if you come across if you find yourself doing something that you thought would be a good idea, but now you're going, man, this is fake. This is this is me cheating. It's much easier to throw it away if you've decided anyway that you don't know what you're doing. You're finding it out as you go. Whereas if you were going, no, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm planning here. I think it would be uh, harder to let go of the thing that's not working. 
that's what I've always found with outlines. They start to feel like sacred text. They start, yeah. start to feel like you can't deviate. And you're like, but I need to deviate. And then you're fighting with yourself. It's like, you wrote that, yeah. you wrote that crap down. It was just a, <laughs> as bad an idea as all the other ideas you've had this week. But because you put it in as an outline, it somehow feels, you know, mm-hmm. like text. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I promised uh, uh, Dennis and Tana that I would be the bad guy to, to jump in and, and switch us over to questions. But before I, I, I do, um, Dennis, I just want to thank you so, so very much for coming on as our interviewer for today. Um, yeah, oh, this was a time. joy. We could have kept doing it. We were having a blast. Yeah. 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 We need to do a pint sometime. Thank you. We will. We'll so do that pint. I will get there. You, you have a wonderful uh, kickoff. Congratulations. This is always the biggest day. You know, enjoy. Congrats on the book yeah. being published. Thank you so, so much. Okay, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Dennis. Everybody else, take care. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. We're going to switch over to questions. Just as a reminder, if you still have a question that you'd like to submit, just click on the Q&A button here at the bottom and submit it. Uh, We've got a lot of great ones, though, so we will just get started right away. Um, Looks like our top question to start off with is, do you have a favorite character that you've written? Oh, oh, that's a really good one. Okay, it's going to depend on how you define favorite character, because the easiest one to write was probably Frank Mackey, who's a narrator in Faithful Place. For whatever reason, I think because he's quite glib and he is quite a smart ass, he's quite easy to write on a sentence level and fun to write on a sentence level. But if you're talking favorite, like who would I go for a pint with, who would I have a chat with? I'd say it's Cassie Maddox from The Likeness, because I tend to write difficult narrators who are not necessarily people who would be easy to get along with and she I think is the one who even though we don't have very much in common the one who would be easiest to have a chat with but my personal favorite like I think it's always going to be Rob Ryan from In the Woods Mm -hmm. because when I was writing that book right it was my first book practically nobody even knew I was writing anything I was ridiculously broke living in a teeny granny flat writing this book that I had no reason to think anybody would ever want to read out there. So it kind of felt like it was just me and him. Mm-hmm. All the other books, there were expectations, there were editors, there were there was the pressure to, oh my God, I can't let people down if they're gonna pay money for this. But that book was just a little bit different. And I think he's always gonna have a special place for me because of that. You have so many to pick from. Um, are there any, so some questions on process in here. Are there any concrete techniques that you've used when approaching rewriting or revising? No, you know what, the only one is keep doing it until it's right. And this was one of the joys for me in moving from acting to writing, where in acting, because I was theater, I was never film, you have to get it right every night because this audience is never gonna see it again. This is their one shot, you have to get it right. Whereas in writing, if you need to write a paragraph 50 times and 49 of them are absolutely awful, that's fine, that's okay. You only have to get it right once because then you can keep that one. So I think that's the big one. Yeah. The, the big tip for me in rewriting and editing is I remember that I've only got to get it right once. So if it keeps sucking all day, that's okay. I'll come back to it tomorrow. It only has to be right once. Um, you, you kind of got into this next question a little bit just here at the end, um, but just to put it in a slightly different way, is there a moment when you are seeing, when suddenly the big picture of the book comes together for you and you sort of have that revelation of how how the revelation is going to occur to the reader, how the plot is going to unfold to them. Well, a lot of the time I only sort of stumble across it at not far off the point when the reader would stumble across it. Like I'm usually a couple of chapters ahead when it comes to the big, you know, who done it or what happened thing. And there is that moment and it's a wonderful one because that's the moment where you think, Dennis and I were talking about that awful moment in the middle of the book where you were like, what was I thinking, (laughs) forget it. Oh, no, no, this isn't going to work. And that revelation moment where you go, oh, okay, there is a book here. That's a huge relief because that's the moment when you realize that probably you are going to finish that and you're not going to have to phone your agent and tell him that you want to be a broke actor again. You know? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's an absolutely lovely moment. But for me, I think, and also for people who write like Dennis does, I think it tends to come a little later. Mm -hmm. than for the planners. I think for the planners, there's probably that moment comes early on when you go, okay, yeah, my characters are fitting into place. Well, the plot is trucking along. We're good to go. Yeah. Whereas if you're winging it, 
it comes much later in the book. You're maybe two thirds, three quarters of the way through before you can go, yes, it's all gonna fit together. Oh, and look, that thing that I started earlier, that's gonna fit in here and that's gonna fit in here. And yes, it's gonna work, but it comes quite later on, yeah. Um, I, I do really like this question and, and it, it does sort of get, um, was addressed a little bit in our conversation. But uh, one of the things, so here's the question. One of the things that I think you capture so well is how ambivalent nostalgia can be. Is nostalgia a theme you intentionally address? Uh, it sounds like this new book might be a move away from that. That is such a cool question because yes, this is probably the first book in which the relationship between past and present isn't somehow a big thing. And yeah, I've always been fascinated by that. I, when I was a little kid, my first career choice was I was gonna be an archeologist and I was gonna discover Troy. And I was so annoyed when I found out that somebody had already been there and done that. And so I ditched my career choice and here I am. But that idea of the relationship between past and present is very interesting to me and always has been. And I think because of that nostalgia, <sighs> all the sides of it, both how it can be a destructive force and how it can be, how it can be productive, how having an awareness of the past can help us to shape the present better. And our relationship with the past, how it needs to be maybe reshaped to be healthier. All of these things have fed into a lot of my books. And yeah, that was one thing I deliberately didn't want to do in this book, because what I was trying to do was do something different. I don't ever want to get caught in the trap of writing the same book over and over. Mm -hmm. And I think it's especially easy to do if you're writing genre because the basic matrix is so fixed. You know, A kills B and C finds out who done it. If you've got that basic shape in place, I think it can be dangerously easy to slide into going, okay, I know how to make that pattern work this way. So I'm gonna keep doing it this way. And I don't want to fall into that trap. So with this book, I was consciously going, okay, I want to get away from a few of the patterns I've fallen into. And one of those was definitely, I'm not gonna do anything that has to do with the relationship between the past and the present. No, this guy is gonna live in the present, end of story. Uh, and, and in fact, the very next question um, it picks on the, the, you know, the, the previous form of the past and the present interacting each other, with each other. Um, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts on creating characters and trying to weave their past and their present together? Um, does that present precede their past when you're creating them or does, you know, how does that fit together? I think it goes back and forth a lot. I'm not actually sure because I haven't thought about it. So I'm kind of trying to think back to how characters fit it in. I think the first thing I tend to get is a sense of who the character is in the moment right now. And then you work backwards and figure out what would have made someone become like that. So it's, it's actually not far off what an archeologist or a detective does. You're presenting, you start with, this evidence and then you have to work backwards and figure out what pattern of events could possibly have got somebody to be here. And it's something I, I did quite a bit with the, the Murder Squad books when I was switching narrator because I would switch, somebody who'd been a secondary character in one book would turn out to be the narrator of the next one. And because of that, I had a kind of snapshot of who that person was in the, in the present of the previous book. But once you're writing somebody as a narrator, you you can't take that shallow view. Mm -hmm. The first time they've seen, they're seen, they've been seen through the lens of the narrator of that other book who clearly is seeing them the way they want to see them or the way they need to see them or the way they presented themselves. But when you switch to that character being the narrator, you have to go into much more depth and you have to understand what made them be that kind of person. And that usually involves delving into their past. I mean, just the easiest example is, um, in Faithful Place, there's a secondary character called Scorcher Kennedy, mm -hmm. who is very sort of pompous, rule-bound, everything in triplicate, you always follow the rules. And he's seen that way partly because the narrator, Frank Mackey, needs to see him that way for his own reasons. But in Broken Harbor, the next book, Scorcher is the narrator, and obviously he's not going to see himself mm -hmm. as this very pompous, rule-bound git. He's going to see the reasons and the the damage and the cracks in him that make him into somebody who believes that you you have to follow the rules because your mind is not a reliable place and you cannot trust it to guide you right. So I started with the snapshot of this kind of annoying rules lawyer and had to work backwards into his past to make him find to to figure out what would make him that way. 
yeah, for all, for all writers watching this right now, that was the most clear uh, definition of perspective I've pretty much ever heard. Um, so next question, thank you so much. Uh, your novels have been such an escape for my friends and me during quarantine. Um, I know The Searcher contains a discussion of police violence in America, and I'm curious if you could tell an American audience a little bit about the Irish attitudes towards detectives or the Garde. Um, your protagonists who are detectives often seem to believe so deeply in the profession. Okay, this was actually something that I was a little bit nervous about was the it, it's peripheral to the main story. It's just a snapshot of backstory. But there is, in fact, a depiction of police violence in the US back when Cal was a cop. And I was a bit wary of it because the whole relationship between police and community is so different in Ireland. Just to take the most basic fact, our police don't have guns, they don't carry guns. So police shootings are kind of not really a thing here. I think the last time the police killed anybody, it was, I think it was 10 years ago. I could have the exact, it was something around 10 years ago. And it was in the course of an armed robbery and it was two white guys who, there was a shootout and they both got shot. So the, we, don't get me wrong, we have problems with police brutality as a society. We have problems with racism, but they're entirely different from what there is in America. It's, it's not, the same, it's not coming from the same place, it's not the same narrative, and it's not having the same results. Yeah. So I felt like it felt almost a bit cheeky even trying to take on writing about this when the whole relationship is so different in Ireland. Now, I wouldn't say we have like this perfect relationship with the police, mm -hmm. but even if you look at their name, it's, it's the Garda Shihana is the police force, which means the guardians of the peace which is what is supposed to be their role. And of course, like everything else, it doesn't always work out like it was supposed to. But I think in my earlier books in particular, I was, the characters do very much believe in what they're doing because that's what I find fascinating is people who believe that by doing this, they're gonna find the answer to some mystery or they're going to put something to rights maybe. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has different motivations for becoming a detective. And I definitely every one of my characters does. I mean, Rob Ryan in, in the Woods is really clearly, although he would never in a million years admit it, trying to fix in some way the unsolved mystery that has cracked his life straight across. He's trying to compensate for that by solving other mysteries. Whereas, you know, other detectives have entirely different motives and Cal and the searcher just, wanted a steady job that would somehow make the world better and help people out and it did not turn out that way. But I'm fascinated, I think, by the different reasons why people would go into detective work and by the different ways they would respond when it does not turn out to fit their early idealism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll take one last question, kind of uh, a question looking into the future a bit. Um, do you think that you'll ever return to the Dublin Murder Squad? Uh, um, I don't know. At the moment, I think it's kind of a good idea to be doing the standalones because, again, I don't want to get into doing the same book over and over again. I don't want to touch on that danger. But I really like the Dublin Murder Squad, you know, and I think yeah. there was more there. I think there's, there's more sweets in that piñata. And I would like to come back to it sooner or later because there are characters in there that I'm like, oh, maybe that person has a story to tell, or you know, maybe there's a dynamic here that I didn't explore, and you know, maybe there's a case that I mentioned somewhere along the way that could be brought back and could have a story of its own. And yeah, I would like to come back to it sooner or later. I don't, who knows? Because like I was just saying with Dennis, I don't even have a plan for the next chapter, <laughs> never mind the next book. But sooner or later, I'd like to, yeah. Excellent. Well, Tana French, thank you so, so much for joining us on your launch date and congratulations on the book being out in the world. Um, for everybody, The Searcher, um, you know, copies are in the mail, as I mentioned. Uh, please give us about three to four weeks to get those delivered. Um, but otherwise, Tana, thank you so much for staying up with us and, and for all your thoughtful answers and your time. Um, and again, I just hope you the best. Wish you, wish you health and, and be well and, and, and good luck on the rest of your tour. Thank you. And how a huge thank you to you and to the community bookstore for having me. It's just lovely. And to all you guys out there watching, thank you so much for coming to this. And thank you for reading the book. And I really hope it doesn't waste your time because God knows time is something none of us have enough of these days. So I've worked really hard to 
hopefully not waste yours. Thank you. Certainly won't. I, I can fully vouch for it to everybody. Um, you wanna be really well and, uh, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Take care, Hal. Stay safe out there. Bye.